That song was a lullaby called Nina Boboy. Now, you may have heard versions of that song, but that song was in a language called Malacca Portuguese. And the singer is Sara Frederica Santa Maria. She's somewhere in the audience here today. And she is one of the many people in the Portuguese community, or the Malacca Portuguese community, who've been working very hard to keep this language alive. Because unfortunately, Malacca Portuguese is among the many languages, not just in Malaysia, but also in the world, which are in danger of disappearing. In fact, the Endangered Languages Catalogue estimates that we lose one language every three to four months. Now, the different sources on endangered languages will give you different statistics, but the message is the same. We are losing languages all around the world at a very alarming rate. So you may say, who cares? Why, why should I be bothered? Why should we be bothered? Well, to begin with, let me ask you to reflect on your own heritage languages, the languages of your parents, the languages of your grandparents, the languages of your great-grandparents, as I tell you the tale of Malacca Portuguese, also known as Papia Cristang. And this language traces its roots to the arrival of the Portuguese in Malacca in the 16th century where unions between the Portuguese and people who traveled with them and locals resulted in a mixed community whose descendants still live in Malaysia. And among them is my maternal side of the family. And here is a picture from the past, blast from the past, of my grandparents, my mom, my aunties and uncles. And this community is known by many names. Some people call them Serani, some people call them Eurasian, Portuguese, Portuguese Eurasians to distinguish them from, you know, people, Eurasians of other uh, Western, with other Western heritage. Um, they're also called Kristang or Genti Kristang, the Kristang people, but some members of the community are not in favor of this term because of its past um, religious reference. So, most of the people who are of Portuguese origin, the biggest group of them, can actually be found in Malacca, of course. And particularly in a place very aptly known as Kampong Portuguese in Malay, or Portuguese village, or Portuguese settlement. And here's where about maybe 1,800 to 1,000 people of Portuguese descent live. Sometimes this village is also referred to as Padre Sechang, priest land, because it was two Catholic priests who were instrumental in bringing people of Portuguese descent to live here way back in the 1930s. So let us look at something else now. If you speak Portuguese, Move the slide. Okay. Oops. Okay. Okay. Right. If you speak Portuguese, right, you might think that song that I heard this now didn't quite sound like Portuguese, didn't sound like the Portuguese spoken in Portugal or Brazil. And you know what? You are right. Because having developed in multilingual Malacca and also in Malaysia, Malacca Portuguese was, and it continues, to be influenced by all the languages that we have around us, okay? So you can see this very clearly in its vocabulary. So let me give you a few examples. So from Malay, we have the word champura. Can you guess champura comes from which Malay word? Tampo, to mix, yeah? And of course, there are also influences from Indian and Chinese languages. So let's have a look at some examples, okay? All right, so this is chakya from Hakka, and it refers to the wooden clogs. Then we also have chengsi, you know, the ladle or the spatula that we use to cook, and that is from Hokkien. Then we have from Konkani, which is an Indian language, we have um, the word chadu, which means clever, it's like all of us here today are very clever, right? 
Um, then there are also influences from Dutch because the Dutch took over Malacca in 1641. So you have words like, let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, Kalkun, referring to Turkey, okay? And also Susi, which refers to sister. So this language has a very rich vocabulary, which has taken words from all the languages it has come into contact with. So if you go to the Portuguese settlement today, you might just hear some of these words being spoken, right? And perhaps you will also be able to experience some of the festivals like uh, Intrudo and also Pesta of Festas and Pad Pedro, which is happening next week, actually. Plus, you might be even luckier, if I can get this to work, to taste this very delicious dish called devil curry, which is a very spicy uh, meat and potato dish made with a blend, blend of dried chilies and ginger and onions and turmeric and candle nuts or bokras as we say, it, galangal, lemongrass and vinegar. And this, this dish is very, um, it's a dish that you will find at most events of Portuguese Eurasians. Then there's also something else. Let's look at another cultural expression. And this is, okay, this is the branho. So you may have heard of this tune, Jinklinona. And Jinklinona, when Jinklinona is played, uh, you can't stop us from getting onto the dance floor to do the branho, which is like joget. Yeah? So these are all cultural expressions of the Malacca Portuguese people. But, you know, cultural expressions themselves don't take away the fact that Malacca Portuguese is a language in danger, right? And so why? Why is this language in danger? Well, there are several reasons for it, and I'll touch on some of the key ones, okay? Okay, okay for some reason. <laughs> okay, right, so... I'm skipping to this, and this is one of the key reasons, mixed marriages. I myself am a product of such a mixed marriage, okay? And you can see here, that's from my parents' wedding in 1965. My father is of Indian um, descent, and my mom is a Sarani. So what happens in families of mixed marriages? Well, in most cases, the language of the family becomes English or perhaps mixed with the language of the non-Portuguese Eurasian parent. And this could be Malay, or Tamil, or Cantonese, or Hokkien. So, but Malacca Portuguese then is not used in the families. And another related reason to this is the number of Malacca Portuguese people, right? Malacca Portuguese people, or Portuguese Eurasians, generally tend to be classified under others. Now, others only make up 0.7 percent of our Malaysian population of about 33 million. So it's a very small population. Now, as you come to Malacca, you get maybe 2,000 people who are categorized as others. And remember, others are not just the Portuguese Eurasians, right? Now, you go further into the Portuguese settlement, and we think about fluent speakers, it's mainly those above 50 to 60 years old that are fluent in Malacca Portuguese. Right, So out of that, say, 1,000 people who live in the settlement, probably half or less than half. And, and of course, this age group is getting older year by year. Okay, So you can see that these two reasons already give us a kind of, all the warning bells are going on. Then related to all of this, as, as people um, get married to other members of other communities, they tend to move out, move out of the settlement, move out of Malacca, and generally, when you are away from your community, you don't have much of an opportunity to use your language, right? And this means that for generations, in fact, maybe three to four generations, and studies have shown this, that people of Portuguese Eurasian descent who live outside of Malacca, outside of uh, the Portuguese settlement, tend to use English as a first language. And this has already happened for three to four or more generations uh, of people of Eurasian descent. Right, so the next reason is related to all of these. And this is the fourth reason, right? So we have the small population, we have intermarriage, and then we also have the fact that 
um, the language of people who move away changes and that is related to the lack of intergenerational transmission, meaning that children don't get to learn the language from their parents or grandparents, especially if the parents and grandparents also do not speak um, Lanka Portuguese anymore, right? So, you know, all these reasons um, kind, of, kind of ask us again, okay, so it's dying. So when the last speaker dies out, this language will die. Just like Tugu Portuguese, which was spoken in Indonesia. It will be like Patua, which is spoken in Macau, which has only a few older speakers left. Um, back to the question, why, why care? Why bother, right? Well, if you think about languages, right? Languages carry within themselves um, so much of information about um, our culture, our traditions, our practices, the way we live our lives. They contain ways of doing things um, or ways of saying things that we can't really say in other languages. I'll try to give you an example from Malacca Portuguese. If I can move this. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So you have to bear with the slowness of technology. So this word saudade, those of you who speak Portuguese will recognize that it comes from a Portuguese word. But for the Malaccan Portuguese, this word saudade has an even more poignant, melancholic, deep sense of loss, of something, of a past connection, maybe centuries ago. And it's really hard to translate this into Malay or English or Tamil or Mandarin because you just can't, it's more than sadness, it's more than missing something. So I'm sure you can think of words in your own languages, your own heritage languages, or the languages that you speak, where it's really hard to express that particular um, feeling or, or emotion uh, in another language, right? And if you think about the 130 plus languages that we have in Malaysia, just imagine how much information these languages contain. And think about the indigenous languages which make up almost 80% of Malaysia's languages. Imagine the wisdom, the indigenous wisdom in them about medicinal plants, about healing rituals, and about how we can live in harmony with nature. Something that's so important today with climate change and environmental degradation. So all these reasons make us think about, okay, so what can we do? So let's look at some uh, examples from Malacca Portuguese because fortunately with Malacca Portuguese, there's been a lot of interest, right? And the community members have been working together, working in collaboration with others with, in different aspects, in language, in music, um, cultural performances, food, and they have and because of this, it has really gotten a lot of media interest, public interest, which is good because such interests can raise awareness, right? Then we get to know, oh, there is a language called Malacca Portuguese. Oh, there is a language called Semai or Temia or Kensu that we didn't know about. And perhaps more importantly, it helps to steer us away from stereotypical views that we have of communities. Because when we don't know, we don't love. Isn't there a Malay saying? To that, to that effect. So it is important, but just having these um, awareness, you know, awareness, media awareness, and so on, is important, but it, we need something more sustainable, something that can really help and encourage the language to be used and to be learned. So let's look at some examples from Malacca Portuguese. Okay. All right. Okay, so here's one example, and you can see three languages being used here. This is an example of a children's reader that I worked with, um, Sarah and other community members. And this is actually from Nina Boboy. And this is actually something, um, one of the materials that we have produced. We also have a course book, like a textbook to teach um, Laka Portuguese, which teacher Sarah uses to teach children and adults, and it can also be used for self-learning. Now, these materials make use of, of the children's, the family's multilingual backgrounds, right? They know English, they know Malay, so now they can also learn uh, Malacca Portuguese. Um, and this 
diagram or the illustration that you see is an illustration by one of the children from the community because we do believe that it's important to involve the younger generation in projects or efforts to keep the language going. Okay, And from these materials, such as this and the course book and, of course, information packs that we can do, this can be used when to do curated tours or visits to the community. So the community can use these materials when they have visitors and they can, they can share their language, they can share their culture, they can even share their physical environment with um, visitors who come. And the most important thing here is that the community must be engaged. This is not like some tour group, they go and you gawk, ah, okay, eh, there's a Malacca Portuguese person there. You know, it's not a museum where you see, ah, that's the, the baju that, you know, the grandma, my grandmother wore, right? But it's more about interaction. So here is an example of the language travels that we did. And I have to say that I have to acknowledge Dr. Amar Mabub from the University of Sydney for mooting this idea because he said, let's try this. And language travels was where you can see a group here, a group of sitting on the floor actually, a group of uh, visitors from a conference from all over, from Brazil, from the Philippines, from US, from Japan. And they were, they were learning Nina Boboy, not just how to sing, they were learning how to perform it. And you can see the children sitting there, they are, they are working with the, with the visitors teaching them their language, teaching them the verses. But I think what's important here is the interaction. So you're not just, you're not just stepping away, but you're interacting with the community. You get to know the community. You get to ask them questions about their life. So these are real examples of how we can actually extend our efforts to promote and to raise awareness about language and culture, but at the same time involve the community so that they see a reason to keep their language and culture going. But I have to stress again here, the important thing is engaging the community and empowering the community, right? Um, and in doing so, you can extend this to other languages as well. And you can extend it to other industries as well, because this can be extended to food. Malaysians love their food. Visitors love our food. But also fashion industry, right? Think of bate, think of songket, think of pua kumbu. So there's actually a lot of opportunities. And for those of you out here today, I'm sure that you can think of even more innovative and creative ways that we can, we can do to promote language, right? And also to teach and learn languages. And even if your own languages are not under threat, you can still play your part. Let people know Malaysia has 131 languages. What are the indigenous languages in Malaysia? What are the minority languages in Malaysia? And what can you do to help to be part of this human mosaic to play your part in promoting you know, awareness about people? Because at the end of the day, behind the language, behind the culture, are fellow Malaysians, no matter what color, no matter how short we are, all right? Whatever size and color we are, we are part of that human mosaic and you need all of us to be a part of that whole, all right? And language and culture does play a big part in this. So moving on, I would really like to, if I can get this to move, <laughs> to leave you with this call for action. And I'm going to do it in Malacca Portuguese, so if nothing else, you can take a picture and you can actually you know, learn some Malacca Portuguese today. And this is to say, bang, come. Faze no saparti, let's do our part. Gadra no salingu kum kultura, right? To, to keep it going, to keep our language, to keep our culture, bibe per sempre. Forever, let us work together to keep our language going. And with that, muito merci, thank you, terima kasih.